Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, conveners, uh, especially Rick and Andy, for uh, inviting me to uh, come over here to talk about some of the modeling work we've been doing. You can hear me? Is it good now? Better? Okay. Um, I was originally uh, asked to talk about modeling of Jovian and Saturnian magnetospheres, and I will be mostly talking about Saturn. Uh, you've heard a very nice talk by Ray yesterday um, covering the Jovian um, magnetosphere simulations. But I think given the similarities between the two, uh, the things we learn from the Saturn simulations uh, could be well applied to uh, Jupiter as well. Um, so I will, uh, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to the model, the adoption of conventional MHD model to the outer planets. And also I'll talk about two sets of simulations we've done. Um, uh, one of which uh, we try to look at the interaction between the solar wind disturbances with the, uh, the Saturnian magnetosphere. The other set of simulations we've done are uh, focusing on the uh, periodicities Margie talked about yesterday. So uh, we, we are using the Michigan model, but uh, most, most of you probably heard of. Um, so in order to adapt the MHD model to Saturn, there are several things you need to consider. First of all, you need to include the mass holding source, as you heard several times uh, at this meeting, which is very important. Uh, the uh, water uh, group ions originating from Enceladus is the primary source of Saturn's magnetosphere. So we need to include that. I'll give you some details in the next slide. And we have um, transitioned from a um, conventional Cartesian coordinates uh, grid to a spherical grid with high resolution near the body, near the magnetosphere, uh, magnetopause and the current sheet in order to resolve the large scale field line currents. And we found that actually for comparable resolution between the Cartesian and the spherical grid, actually the spherical grid does a better job in uh, resolving the, uh, the field line currents. And for, this, uh, for the uh, simulations I'm going to show you, uh, we have about 0.1 Saturn radius resolution in the inner magnetosphere of Saturn. And it goes out, when it goes out it increases and near the magnetopause, which is about 20 RS near the Titan's orbit, we have a resolution of about 0.3 RS. So um, the coupling between the magnetosphere and ionosphere, and we use a conventional approach commonly applied at the terrestrial, in the terrestrial simulations, which we use the uh, field line currents, and we map the field line currents from the inner boundary of the simulation down to the ionosphere, and we solve the, um, uh, the um, convection pattern assuming the electrostatic electric field, and um, for a given pattern of uh, the conductivity distribution in the, in the ionosphere. So for the simulations I'm going to show you, uh, we, we basically we set the hot conductance equal zero. We only use Patterson conductance and they are uniform conductance in the ionosphere. So um, I talk about the mass loading source. I think it's critically important to include that in the Jovian Saturnian simulations. So the way we do in bats is we explicitly include the various terms associated with mass loading for example, the ionization uh, due to uh, photoionization electron impact and also charge exchange between ions and neutrals. And as shown in this, um, in this equation, I'm not going into detail of this, but the important thing here is, as you can see uh, immediately from this, from this um, expression, that when you include the mass loading, um, the ionization charge exchange recombination, they change the, uh, they change the uh, momentum, the energy, and the, uh, the mass of the, of the plasma. So, um, the right-hand side shows a typical distribution of the ionization pattern and the charge exchange we use for Saturn simulation. And here, this shows the um, a cut in the meridional plane, um, the ionization rate, and which peaks around 5 RS, which is slightly outward of the orbit of Enceladus. The reason for that is because, as you heard from Fran and Melissa the other day, the, um, the neutral profile is kind of um, is, um, is expanded uh, from the Enceladus orbit, and so given the electron temperature distribution, the peak ionization is slightly outward of the Enceladus orbit. That's what we used. Uh, we actually adopt a, a kind of a relatively old model from Richardson et al. 1998. And the bottom panel shows the charge exchange rate we use in the simulation. So um, when you include this, and I, I just want to point out, I mean, you, the, these, um, this spatial distribution of the mass loading source could be easily adapted to the newest uh, Cassini observations, which is something we're working on right now. So um, the, uh, another thing I think is pretty relevant to this conference is the uh, um, anospheric source, the outflow, polar wind outflows. And uh, Alex has done some uh, fantastic modeling work uh, 
uh, for Saturn's polar wind. And uh, for the present modeling work, we have not included that in all our simulations, but which is something we should consider in the future simulations. Okay, I'm going to uh, first talk to you about the simulation we've done um, in investigating the interaction between the solar wind disturbances with the Saturn's magnetosphere. So um, when Cassini got into orbit uh, in 2004, uh, which is, I think, um, in the declining phase of the solar cycle, uh, in which we see very frequently the CIR um, structures passing by Saturn, the correlating interaction regimes. So the interest there is to look at how the, how the CIR interacts with Saturn's magnetosphere. There are a lot of evidence from the aurora observations and in situ observations from Cassini that show that Saturn actually responds very strongly to these uh, solar wind disturbances. So we actually, uh, we run our model in order to look at that effect. So to do that, um, the CIR typically spends about a week of time at Saturn's orbit. So we design, we run a simulation for a prolonged time, which is about 750 hours. And we designed an idealized input into the simulation, try to mimic um, the features we see uh, in the CIR at Saturn's orbit. So we introduce, um, so basically we divide the 750 hours into four uh, intervals in which we set the IMF into different orientations, southward, northward, downward, and duskward, among which I think the, probably the spiral field is more relevant, more realistic to Saturn's magnetosphere. Uh, but nevertheless, we tried all different kinds of orientation, and also then during each of this interval, we introduced shocks, you know, arising from the interaction, uh, the, CR, the stream interactions. So there were forward shocks, and uh, one of which is the reverse shock we introduced. So we run a simulation, and actually I just want to point out, this is a very expensive uh, computationally expensive simulation we've done. It takes about two months continuous time on NASA supercomputer for us to finish this uh, very long simulation. So we better get a lot of uh, good things out of this simulation. So the first thing we did uh, was to, um, to make sure that, you know, we got the roughly the large scale structure of Saturn's magnetosphere match, agree with the observations. So the obvious thing to do is to compare, for example, the standoff distance of the magnetopause um, compare that with empirical models established using the Cassini observations. So here what I'm showing is a, throughout the simulation, the simulated magnetopause location in our, uh, we identified in the red curve, red dots, and the blue curve and the green shaded area is the prediction from one of the uh, best, the newest um, magnetopause model uh, developed by Kanani et al. Uh, in 2010. As you can see, you know, Throughout the whole simulation, we have, uh, by the way, the top panel shows the dynamic pressure uh, in the solar wind. And you can see as the pressure changes, you know, the, um, throughout the whole simulation, and also for different orientations of the IMF, the agreement there is pretty good. I mean, especially, I think, during the typical dynamic pressure intervals and the compressed times, the agreement there is remarkable. So that gives us confidence that, you know, we got a roughly the large scale, um, uh, the, uh, the size of the magnetosphere uh, um, consistent with the, uh, with the inference from the observations. So I'm not going to talk, um, so I think given the time, I can only cover a very limited uh, set of uh, things we see in the simulation, but I think one of the most interesting thing um, in this rapidly rotating magnetosphere, as you heard from previous talks, um, and also Tom's talk this morning, this large scale reconnection in the tail, the, in the rapidly rotating magnetosphere. So we try to look at that. Um, and the suggestion by various uh, previous uh, authors uh, that the centrifugally driven uh, acceleration of the plasma in these magnetospheres will eventually stretch the field lines and pinch off plasmoids. And that provides a very useful means for releasing the plasma from the inner magnetosphere, from the magnetosphere out to the solar wind. So we've looked at one of the intervals during which um, I think the solar wind influences is very minimal. So we we see the signatures of reconnection by looking at the normal component of the magnetic field in the current sheet. You can identify, for example, here in the top panel shows the BZ, which is normal component to the, uh, to the current sheet. You see the reversal of BZ in the, in the, uh, from post-midnight to dawn sector. We're looking from the, uh, the tail uh, towards Saturn. And the bottom panel shows the uh, plasma density contours. As you can see is, you know, there are enhanced plasma density and also uh, reversal of the normal component of the field. When you trace the field lines in, near that region, what you find is in the bottom panel here, there are loops, magnetic loops, with uh, very, very small very, or very little, almost zero uh, core field. And these green lines are the plasmoid we see arising from this just pinching off 
of mass loaded flux tubes. And but interestingly enough, surrounding these closed loops, you see here the magenta field lines, there are, there are still closed field lines. There have, they have two ends attached to the planet, which kind of confines the, the motion of this, um, of this um, plasmoid, which are ejected from the reconnection. So what we find is because this, before they are being pinched off, they, struck, they have this rotation, they have this angular momentum. Uh, as soon as they are pinched off, they are still moving, actually, in the co-rotation direction. You know, they eventually leak out the magnesium from the downside, magneto pause. So, um, so this is the one type of the, I think this shows very nicely how in the, in the rapidly rotating magnetosphere, how this um, reconnection uh, happens uh, spontaneously um, uh, on the mass loaded flux tubes. And the other thing that we found in the simulation is, as I, as I mentioned, we have introduced different kinds of IMF orientation in the simulation. And during certain periods of time, for example, your spiral field, you expect the um, component reconnection taken, taking place near the, man, near the magnetic pulse that brings in open flux in the polar cap. So under those conditions, when you have plasma, uh, when you have reconnection takes place in the tail, it will involve open flux, open field lines in the, in the tail lobes. So that's something we also see in the simulation. So here shows a, a view, an equatorial view of the simulated magnetosphere. here. Color contour here, again, is the BZ component, the normal component to the current sheet. And the, uh, there are several other things I've plotted here. Uh, field lines are color-coded according to their density. Uh, and also there are uh, field line currents pattern is mapped into the uh, ionosphere. And the, color con the contours here, I believe, is, um, is um, plasma density in the equatorial plane. So the thing to note here is this uh, rope-like uh, field lines uh, arising from the tail reconnection. And surrounding them are these blue lines with very low density. Those are the reconnected lobe field lines. And they're surrounding this, um, this flux rope, accelerating them uh, down the tail. As you can see, um, clearly in this plot, when we put a virtual satellite in the tail, in this case about 80 RS in the simulation, and look at the passage of the, plus, the uh, flux rope, and the associated structure. So top panel, what I'm, sh what I'm plotting here is magnetic field in various components, BR in, in red, and B theta, uh, which is BZ, equivalent to minus BZ. Um, here shows a very nice bipolar signature. And also the, the green line here is B5, which is equivalently the core field. Uh, that shows the enhancement during, near the center of that, that structure. And you see the enhancement in plasma density and the pressure. And here shows the radial velocity and the reason I'm plotting that is because we have very nice uh, observation from Cassini caps shown here um, um, by uh, Hill et al. 2008, which is, this, which is one of the few events, you know, fortunately Cassini is able to observe in the tail near the downside magnetosphere. What's being shown here is the same color scheme. Um, the B, uh, BR, uh, B theta is the red, uh, blue curve, shows a very nicely bipolar signature and the B5, the enhancement in the core field direction. So, the interesting thing here to note is here, the caps and measurements of the radial flow velocity shows a dramatic enhancement behind actually the core, after the core, the passage of the core of the plasmoid, you know, exceeding about 800 kilometers per second, which is very similar to what we see here in our simulation. And I think that is it's clear that those are associated with the fast flows behind the plasmoid that's produced by this low break connection, which has very high open speed the inflow RFN speed is, is very high in the lobes compared to the, in the plasma sheet. So the reconnection we see there in the tail produces, you know, releases and accelerates the plasmoids down tail, but it also uh, produces a significant impact to the inner magnetosphere and to the ionosphere. So here what I'm trying to show is the same event we see in the simulation, the return flows. Fr here, here we're looking from the sun down to the equatorial plane. So these are the fast flows coming back from the tail, arising from the same reconnection event. And if you trace the fuel lines, you map that into the ionosphere, you see an enhancement in the upward fuel line currents on the downside. And those could be um, well related to the, some of the events we see in the aurora observations. Sometimes you see a dramatic down downside enhancement brightening in the aurora emissions. And to further illustrate the, impa the impact of this, you see one of these uh, Ian A movie from Melissa yesterday. Um, so um, very often, I think Cassini, when, when the viewing geometry is, is uh, permits, we see large-scale uh, ENA emissions blobs, you know, arising uh, in the in the magnetosphere. So here, um, this is another event, uh, different from what Melissa has shown, but this is from I think is including the Mitchell et al. Uh, uh, the AGU monograph, which is uh, going to be published 
uh, this year. So um, let me play this movie first. So by the way, we're looking, we're looking from the noon side, uh, looking down to the equatorial plane, we're post noon. So the X points to the sun. So this region is the midnight. So this is midnight and dawn, and this is dusk. What you're gonna see is um, sometimes you see a large blob of ENAs, enhancement, arising you know, just from the midnight region and it's rotating around from midnight to dawn. And you see yesterday from when Melissa shows, you see the enhancement in the aurora emissions on the downside very nicely. So what I have done here is we try to produce a kind of equivalent view of the ENAs. Um, but I think this, you should not take this as the absolute, you know, the, the indication of how the ENA is moving, but just try to mimic that. So the way we did this is we take the MHD model sim, uh, results, we use the temperature as an indicator of the reconnection products. Then we convolve into that is kind of a certain neutral distribution in the manusphere. We multiply the two, and we're also taking into account the decay. Uh, so it's a very crude model of this, but I think it shows nicely as I play this movie, we'll try to use the same kind of similar size as we see in the ENA movies. By the way, this is the orbit of Titan. The ENA basically sees around the orbit of Titan and gradually moves in to the inner manusphere. So as I play this, you're going to see, oh, I go back. Is for that same event, here in the post-midnight uh, post region, you see this enhancement of the blob kind of emissions and it goes around uh, the, uh, the manusphere. And probably it's not very easy to see here. We try to plot also the field line currents, upward field line currents in the ionosphere, and then we see some enhancement associated with this rapidly moving hot plasma uh, flux tubes from the tail and coming into the, manu um, the day side and the inner manusphere. And I think this link um, is very well summarized in this uh, GRL cover figure we produced for uh, one of the, uh, the uh, Frontier articles that Michelle Thompson wrote last year. Shows this, this linkage between the uh, large-scale tail reconnection, um, and we see in situ and also the ENA enhancement uh, in the middle manusphere. So um, there are a lot of other things I would not um, have time to talk about. We look at the open flux variation in the manusphere, the dependence of that in the, um, on the external conditions. We look, look at how the mass is lost through the system, and also we look at the distribution, the flux, to, for example, the flux to content in the manusphere, the convection pattern, how that varies. As, as, a, uh, as the external conditions vary. So a lot of interesting stuff we, we've talked about in that 2012 paper. But I would like to spend the rest of my um, time talking about this modeling we've done in terms of, uh, in looking at the uh, periodicities uh, Margie has talked about yesterday. Um, so I would not talk much in detail about this, but the, I think the, we see a variety of the periodic phenomena in Saturn's manusphere. The most uh, uh, notable ones are, are the SKR, um, power the, um, as function of time, as you see here. But we also see that in the, very clearly in the magnetic field, as you heard yesterday, the EMA fluxes in the magnetosphere and the densities measured by, uh, by Cassini in the inner magnetosphere. So all these points um, show very clearly there is a, certainly a periodic uh, organization in, the, in Saturn's magnetosphere. Wow, that's great. Okay, I'm going to skip this one. Um, you see yesterday the, uh, the model we've developed to try to understand this periodic phenomena. We introduce a vortex, a, we superimpose this rotating vortex in the ionosphere, and we put that, we couple that with the bus RS, and we use that to drive the magnetosphere, and we, look, we study the ex response of the system to the imposed vortical flow in the ionosphere. So we conducted a set of uh, series of simulations. Uh, we've looked at, but all these are kind of proof of uh, principle simulations. So we use very symmetric conductance in the ionosphere, but the difference between north and the south try to mimic the southern summer conditions where the Cassini, um, the prime mission, is take, was uh, taking place. We looked at, um, first looked at the dominant the southern period, and later we look at the two periods uh, the, from the two hemispheres. So um, the first thing we checked is when you impose these vertical flows in the ionosphere, it produces the field line currents, and the, when the field line currents uh, flow into the magnetosphere, they interact with the magnetospheric plasma and produce the perturbations in the fields and the plasma. So the first thing we checked is whether or not we were able to reproduce what we, what we see in the Cassini magnetometer observation. So here shows the perturbation magnetic field in the equatorial plane. And you see here roughly inside of 10 or uh, 15 RS, you see a quasi-uniform field rotating with the planet. And that is what we see in the Cassini observation, that 
is produced by what the so-called CAM current system proposed by uh, uh, Southwood and Kivos in 2007. So um, when you compare that with the Cassini statistical observations from Cassini measurements, you see that they match fairly well. You know, um, depending on the face of the of the source, you got a very good agreement uh, between two, an, a quantitative agreement. The perturbation field there is is very similar to what we see in the um, in the Andrews et al. Um, study, and we also you can also look at the dramatic response of the manuscript to these imposed flows. And we see the magnetic deposit moving in and out. We see the plasma pressure is being modulated. Um, I'm going to skip this. I want um, this one. I want to talk about. And yesterday, I think Pat asked about the dual periodicities um, in the in the Saturn system. So we've run a simulation that we impose two pairs of vortices: one in the northern hemisphere, the other in the southern hemisphere, rotating at a slightly different periods. And those periods are corresponding to the SKR periods. We see from the Cassini RPWS observation. So here, then, we look at the response in the magnetosphere. We look at the magnetic perturbations at different latitudes above and below the current sheet. And in the northern hemisphere, probably it's not easy to see, uh, we see the period is predominantly, the, the perturbation is predominantly uh, the northern period, in six hours. In the southern hemisphere, if you look at the FFT result spectra, it's predominantly the southern period. So although we have field lines are linking the two hemispheres, but it looks as if you know, the perturbations are dominant by the, the signal that is in that respective uh, hemisphere. Um, I'm going to skip this. Uh, one thing I want to point out is, you know, this bow shape uh, current sheet that George talked about yesterday, we uh, seen in the Cassini data. I think the very similar effect has been recently seen in the, in the Earth's magnetosphere. When you put in that uh, non orthogonal solar wind attack, uh, attack angle in our simulation, you can reproduce very well this kind of bow shape of current sheet, um, which we see in the Cassini data. And of course, in addition to that, we see this flapping of the current sheet arising from the periodic modulations. Mark showed it yesterday, this movie, so I'm going to skip that. And we can compare the location of the current sheet with the observations. These are the locations throughout the simulation. It matches fairly well with what we see in the, uh, in the data. So there are a lot of things um, I don't have time to cover, but I think we just start to dig, uh, um, start to dig deep into the simulation, try to understand. We see it now a lot of responses are very consistent with, with uh, qualitatively and quantitatively with the observations. I was trying to understand deeply how this, um, how the different parts of the, of the Saturn uh, manuscript are, are linked. So I'll stop here. I just want to briefly mention some open questions. As I mentioned, we use uniform conductance, um, but something we need to consider in the future is the effects of the non-uniform, you know, precipitation associated conductance. That I believe Yingo will talk about uh, next talk and outflows from the ionosphere, and of course the mass holding rate, which is very uncertain uh, observationally. It's very poor, kind of poorly constrained. Uh, observationally, we're going to consider the effects of that and, of course, the interplay between the solar wind and the internally driven processes. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess I won't apologize. All the large groups uh, come to these conferences so they can ask questions of people that are uh, five doors away, and I'm no different. Uh, I, 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 would like to, uh, I, I would like to call attention, though, to the fact that uh, uh, at this point, uh, the first surveys of uh, plasmoids are just being completed at uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and, uh, and Mercury. Uh, in the case of uh, Jupiter, uh, uh, Marissa uh, Vogt's uh, paper, I think, has just been pos posted. Uh, Katrina Jackman's uh, survey of um, all the Cassini da data to date uh, is in a late stage of um, refereeing. And Gina DiBraccio is finishing her dissertation at, uh, at Michigan uh, and uh, has a paper in preparation. The interesting thing that's uh, come out of this is that at uh, Mercury and Earth, the, the plasmoids do have this marked tendency towards the, uh, the flux rope uh, topology uh, with the very, very strong core fields. Uh, at Jupiter and Saturn, uh, see the very clear uh, spiraled fields uh, uh, of the plasmoid proper. See the uh, disconnected lobe field in the uh, post-plasmoid plasma sheet. Again, just like at Earth. But they don't appear, uh, it's very, only in just a incredibly small number of cases uh, do you see the force-free 
question I wanted to ask you from your simulations. Uh, the speculation is uh, one of a couple of things. Either the IMF is so weak in the outer solar system that it's not, uh, that it's not significantly shearing the lobes uh, to provide a seed field for creating uh, the core, mm. or it's possible that with the uh, very, very high beta plasma in the plasma sheet, maybe the plasma is not able to evacuate the, uh, uh, the core of these plasmoids to collapse and form that strong core field, or maybe it's something else. Uh, since you showed sort of examples of both, I wondered what your thinking was. Oh, I, I, I absolutely agree that with the, the, the two um, mechanisms you suggested, you know, the, the, the reasons you suggested, but I, th um, I think in addition to that, there might be a, a, another thing that we need to take into account is, uh, you know, this plasma is the re release location of this plasma is, you know, somewhere between probably 20 and 30 RS down the tail. The, I think the I think we see these studies at the Earth when the plasmoids first formed, they have uh, they have very weak core field. But as soon as they are linked to the the sheath plasma, the sheath magnetic field lines, they have a they have ways of leaking out to the minutiae. So then you can form this strong core field. So there is an evolutionary um, process, you know. So we need to consider the location where we see the plasmoid in the tail. Maybe some distance down the tail the signatures will change. That's something we need to look into in the, from the simulation, which probably can tell us something about, about these, um, these um, things. Um, you talk about the MI coupling through Fairland current, and also Dr. Hale talk about the Birkeland current can transfer energy momentum. I have comments about this. When we turn on the switch of this room, the light is on, and then the who carried the energy come here is a EM wave in light speed. It's not electron in the uh, flow has some velocity in the wire. You know that the speed is a two or three millimeter or centimeter per second is the electron speed. So uh, in our case, the MI coupling carried is by the energy carried or transfer uh, stress is by urban wave at urban speed. Um, I agree. I mean, I think the one of the uh, the assumptions, underlying assumptions we use for this uh, electrostatic mapping is assuming that within the time, within the time, uh, the the waves propagate back and forth and reaching equilibrium, which certainly you know. For Saturn's case, if you take the alpha speed um, between the gap region, which is about two Saturn radii, the, um, the, the time you take is about only, I think, if I get the number, remember the number uh, correctly, you have the only order of a minute or so. so. Okay, thank you very much.